All right, now this is my top five also features of Windows Server 2019. Now, my name's Oren Thomas. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft, but some of you may know me actually as the guy who writes the Windows Server books. I've written Windows Server 2016 inside out. I've written books since Windows Server 2003, and I'm currently working on Windows Server 2019 inside out. So needless to say, if you can write 200,000 words on Windows Server, you probably know something about it. Anyway, in this session, I'm going to talk about things that I really like. And some of these things I'm not necessarily going to go into in a great amount of detail. Now, this stuff is stuff that's going to be already covered in the show. For example, and I'm not going to go into detail, for example, Windows Server 2019 is easily the most secure virtualization platform produced by Microsoft. It's a lot easier to manage in the server core configuration. Why? Because people, uh, Microsoft really wants you to deploy server core rather than server with a GUI. And to be honest, who here has actually deployed server core and kept it in production? Yeah, bugger all, right? <laughs> Most of you go, well, we know we should deploy server core, but what are we going to do? We're going to put server in a GUI. Why? Because if thing goes bloody pear-shaped, you want the GUI rather than trying to hack around in the command line. OK, so seamless integration with cloud technologies. That sounds like some bugger from marketing wrote that. But what it means is that Windows Server 2019 is much more integrated with Azure or allows you to integrate it. You don't have to, but if you heard the keynote this morning, there's a whole lot of talk about the management layer being Azure and then the on-prem layer being what you've got. And sort of where we seem to be going with a lot of this is that maybe the overmind exists in the cloud, but your actual uh, working stuff exists on-prem. It'll host Windows and Linux container workloads, and it predicts when it's reached is going to reach capacity. So I'll go into some of these in a bit more detail. The first one I want to go into, the most important thing, if you're a Windows Server administrator, is this new way to manage Windows Server. It's called Windows Admin Center. It's a web-based console. It's an extensible console. It's a frequently updated console. All new Windows Server features going forward are going to be surfaced in Windows Admin Center. You're not going to get a new management console. OK, so if, you want it, if it's a new feature, it's going to be in Windows uh, Admin Center. You can use it with any modern standards compliant browser. You can use it to manage multiple servers. It runs on Windows Server. It can even run off your Windows 10 workstation where you connect to it locally. It runs its own micro web server. It's not IIS, it's its own thing. And then it can reach out and then be used to manage a bunch of other servers. It's an, a replacement for your inbox remote server administration tools. It's certainly not a system center replacement. And at the moment, it doesn't replace all of these. But this is where it's going. So what's happened is that we've introduced this tool, we've introduced a basic set of features, and we're increasing those over time. Every month, new features come out. The idea is at some point to have everything that's in RSAT covered by Windows Admin Center, as well as new stuff, so that eventually you don't bother with your RSAT tools. You don't worry about them. You can use them to manage on-prem and cloud resources, and unlike other tools that may exist if it have existed in the past, people go, well, do I need an Azure subscription to use it? No, you bloody don't. You can run this for free. OK, you're already licensed for it. It's a free tool that you can download. So let me give you an at a glance so that you can actually see what it does. So local users and groups. This is what the local users and groups functionality looks like. You can see a bunch of local users. We've got devices. You can go and manage your devices like you would in Device Manager, except for you can do it remotely against a server. What you can also do is you can click on this, you can click on Actions, and you can do things like update and roll back device drivers, should you so choose. If you've got certificates, this, I reckon, is absolutely bang on awesome. You can go in and see 
all your expired certificates. You can see all the certificates that are about to expire. You just remotely connect to the server and it'll give you a list of everything that's about to come up. So no longer will you have an excuse for there being expired certificates on your computer. With events, you've got the event viewer. Basically, go through your event logs. You can go and filter the logs. You can go and do all of that, again, through the web browser. You can go and manage your firewall rules, again, through the web browser, either locally on the machine, or you can go and do it and manage servers remotely. You can manage your installed applications. You can add and remove applications through this dialog box. This is just basically add remove programs. You can go and manage your processes. It's like task manager except for remotely. So if you've got a runaway process, bang, you can go in through the web browser, assuming the server's responsive, and go and kill it. You can go and add roles and features. Now, here's something absolutely fantastic for the long-term Windows Server administrators out there. Windows Server 2019 has still got wins. If you want job security, this is the role you specialise in because it seems to never, ever, ever go away, right? We've been told that Wins has been going away since Windows 2000 and it's still there. Pardon? It's Windows, well, it, it's Wins just because it's awesome. It's not called Losers, is it? OK, you can manage your services. You can start, stop, and configure your services again through Windows Admin Center. You can manage virtual machines. So again, you can config, connect to a Hyper-V server. You can go and do, it's exactly like Hyper-V console, except for one of the things you can do in this console that you can't do in Hyper-V console very easily is when you're spinning up a virtual machine, you can specify the number of virtual processes to allocate to it. If you were just doing that through Hyper-V Manager, you had to deploy the virtual machine, right-click on it, and then go and bump that little duva to make it go up. You've got registry editor, remote registry editing through the browser. You've also got AD. You can do Active Directory users and computers. Again, at the moment, it's still in preview. It's not doing everything it needs to. But imagine, in a year's time, it'll be a lot closer to doing so. You've got DNS. You can manage DNS, again, through the browser. You can manage DHCP through the browser. So the idea is that all you do is you go and deploy it. You can even deploy it on a thing called a gateway server. You connect to the gateway server, and then from the gateway server, you go out and connect to each server that you want to manage. But the idea is if you've got this, you don't need server with a GUI, because all these tools can be used to remotely manage, in a graphical manner, Windows Server. OK, the next thing that's really awesome about Windows Server 2019 uh, is storage migration services. Why? Because file servers are an absolute pain in the backside to go and migrate. They've often got people pointing to file shares with IP addresses, maybe by name, picking up all the share permissions and moving the share permissions is an absolute pain. So storage migration services is a role that's built into Windows Server 2019. What it allows you to do at a very high level is point at a source file server and then point at a basically unconfigured Windows Server 2019 box. And what it'll do is it'll go, right, what's your identity? What's your, all your addresses? All of that, bang, 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 bang. I'm going to take it off you. I'm going to plug it onto you. I'm going to pick up all the files, folders, and shares that are on you, and I'm going to go and drop it on you. So if you've got that 2003 file server, which none of you should have, or your 2008 file server, you can use this tool to migrate that file server across to server 2019. The way that it works is it does an inventory of the source server. It transfers all of that data and all of that inventory across to the destination server. And then, when it's sure that it's done everything and it's done all of those checks to see that the destination server looks like it should, it'll perform the cutover and then rename the source server. So that if something goes completely pear-shaped, I have to be really polite in America. I can't swear like an Australian. And it's really like culturally hurting me. I'm feeling <laughs> oppressed. I should be able to swear a lot more. But I know that you guys get upset by that. You need more stuff in your world that will kill you. And then you'll be more expletive uh, enabled. 
So discover the data, copy it across. So the next one, system insights. The whole idea of system insights is that what system insights will do is you turn it on, and then it'll go and monitor your CPU, it'll go and monitor your storage, it'll go and monitor your network. And what it'll do, it'll do capacity forecasting. So it'll look at how this is being used over time. And then what it'll do is it'll alert you, it'll go, hey, Oren, in uh, three months' time, given the way that your file server's working, you're going to run out of space or you're going to run out of CPU capacity because you're just going to be pegging the processor. So it does volume, storage consumption, CPU capacity, and network capacity. This is what the reports look like, and you can see here, OK, volume B, given the utilization, is going to run out of space in about three days. So instead of finding out that something's run out of space because a whole lot of people are ringing you up and screaming about the fact that they can't write any files, you know about it beforehand. So in theory, you can be that mystical unicorn called proactive. Linux runs on Windows Server 2019. So you've got Windows subsystem for Linux, obviously on Windows 10. You can run it on Windows Server 2019. Now, why is this cool? Because you might have people that are you know, very fond of penguins in your environment. And they're like, I don't want to go and touch those dirty Windows servers. But you're like, well, you know what? I want you to run your container workloads on Windows Server. OK, so we can compromise here. We can install an SSH server on Windows Server. We can configure the default shell for SSH server to be Windows subsystem for Linux. We can then enable Linux containers on Windows Server 2019. So your Penguin-friendly admins are SSHing into a Windows box, into a Linux environment, and managing Linux containers. But your overall platform is still running Windows. There's also support now for Windows Server as a Kubernetes node. So if you've got a Kubernetes cluster, you can have Windows Server as a Kubernetes node. Linux containers, the traditional methods, run Linux containers on a Linux VM under Hyper-V. The new method is running Linux containers on Windows Server directly using Hyper-V isolation. You can run Linux containers and Windows containers concurrently. So your environment, instead of sort of sitting there going, you know what, we need a whole bunch of Linux VMs, or we need a whole bunch of Linux servers to host our Linux containers, we need a couple of Windows servers to host those Windows containers. Now you can have one server as your platform for containers, and it'll run both versions of containers. In terms of storage, ReFS now has deduplication. Storage class memory support. You would have heard of new storage class memory. That's the super, super, super fast memory. Again, supported in Windows Server. And then we've got cluster sets. Now, what's a cluster set? What a cluster set is, is a way of federating your clusters. So you may have tried upgrading a cluster in the past and found it to be a complete pain. Or you may have wanted to move workloads from one cluster to another. Or you might have been, in terms of upgrading, you might have been doing a hardware refresh on a cluster. And it would have been a pain. Well, with cluster sets, what you can do is you can create a new cluster with a new, cluster, a new hardware. You have your old cluster with the old hardware. You configure them as being part of the same cluster set. And then you can migrate workloads from this cluster to this cluster seamlessly. The idea is that you can have super clusters where you federate all of your clusters together. So when you use cluster sets, there's loosely coupled, loosely coupled federated grouping of multiple failover clusters. They're a pseudo cluster. You can have virtual machine fluidity across member clusters within a set. You can even have balancing and maintenance, self-managed and dynamically updated namespace. So you can configure to deploy a VM to the cluster set. And then what it'll look for is it'll look for the least utilized cluster within that cluster set. It'll throw the VM onto that. And then that cluster will determine which node hosts the VM based on that. Does not interfere with normal cluster operations. Easily allows you to migrate VMs across clusters. Tracks which cluster hosts the VM and the individual cluster managers of VM placement. Great when decommissioning clusters, as it allows you to move all VMs onto a new cluster without doing all that mucking around that's generally involved in that process. 
Storage Replica. Storage Replica was available in 2016 DC, which would provide an asynchronous and asynchronous block level replication of a volume. So what you do is you turn on Storage Replica, and you might Storage Replica from one volume to another in the same box, or use a Storage Replica from this computer here to that computer over in another site. But what it would be is if you performed failover, you had a complete copy at a block level of a volume in another location. With Storage Replica, you can create stretch clusters. In 2019, it's available in the standard edition of Windows Server. So you don't have to bump yourself to the data center edition. However, it is limited to a single volume in 2019 standard edition. You've got one partnership and let, instead of unlimited partnership, and it'll only go up to two terabytes in size. DC edition does not have this limitation. Windows Defender application control. If you had code integrity policies in Windows Server 2016, think of this as a hardware-enforced app locker for application execution. This is the other thing we're starting to do more with security now. What we're doing is we're saying, OK, we're going to whitelist what applications we're allowed to run. And if it's not on the whitelist, it doesn't run. This is much more secure than sort of taking the approach of I'll try and sort of blacklist a bunch of applications that I don't want to run. So this is a good way of stopping you know, your junior administrator running that Bitcoin miner on your server without telling you. <laughs> It'll block known executables that can block code integrity policies. That was something that people used to do. They, used to, they found a way around things like AppLocker by running certain applications that would block AppLocker. Server core application compatibility. If you've ever deployed server core and then tried to run certain things on it, you find, well, it doesn't run. Why? Because there's some weird library in there that needs to be there. There's some weird compatibility layer that's in the GUI version that's not in the server version. So with server core application compatibility, what it does is it runs a subset of server with desktop experience and then allows you to run Microsoft Management Consoles, Resource Manager, PowerShell ISE, Hyper-V Manager, Event Viewer, Device Manager, Disk Manager, Task Scheduler, Performance Monitor, File Explorer, Failover Cluster Manager, Edge, the Chromium version, as well as all of Mark Racinovich's Sys, uh, Sys Internals tools directly on Windows Server Server Core. So you don't have to have everything sitting there but you can have a lot more and then also a lot of applications that wouldn't run. Like there's people that couldn't deploy server core. Why? Because there's a bloody device driver that required a graphical user interface for some reason. You know, why does your network card driver need to have pictures? Apparently it does, right? Well, this will help solve that problem sometimes. Okay. If you want to know more about this session, go to the Session Resources Hub at aka.ms, MSI11. If you've got any questions, come down the front. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention, and please fill out an evaluation.